Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Tara Goddard and I just finished my PhD at Portland State University in Urban Studies. Um, and it's really nice to come talk to you guys about the work I did for my dissertation. So we will get right into it. Um, of course, as, as you should get in a good habit of doing, I always like to acknowledge my dissertation committee, which included Dr. Jennifer Dill as my chair. Um, and then also the National Institute for Transportation and Communities for giving me money. Uh, and the Federal Highway as well, because I got an Eisenhower Transportation Fellowship, which helped fund this research. So I don't think I need to tell you guys, you know, you guys are in public health. So you, you understand and you know that a lot of people are interested in, and I'm mostly talking about bicycling today, um, and not pedestrian issues. But you know that a lot of people are interested in promoting bicycling, right? We know it's healthy. We know it reduces emissions. There's a lot of good reasons. A lot of... Um, Cities in particular are looking to increase in the US levels of bicycling, so we know that's going on. Um, but at the same time, and I know there's been other seminars that address some of this, um, it's, it's disproportionately safe to what you'd expect for how many people do it, right? If you were looking at just as a share of traffic crashes, which are crashes that involve a automobile, there is, this is uh, data from 2014, I think, about two bicyclists per day were killed um, and then 50,000 injured, right? And so injuries, you think about not just like the immediate injury, which, you know, is unfortunate and can be very serious, but also the lasting quality of life effects. Like, do you ever get back to your full mobility and things like that? So injuries are serious as well. Um, and then pedestrians, it's an even worse uh, number. So the question is, what is going on and how can we do something about it? So here is uh, data from the U.S. looking at the time of day. So why I present this, and I think it's important to note, is that fully half of the crashes with um, fatalities with drivers and bicyclists happen in daytime hours, and another quarter or so happen in the evening. Now, largely this is a function of when people are riding, right? So there's more likely there's just people out who are riding, not as many people ride at this time. But it also says this isn't just a visibility issue, right? This isn't just like, oh, we just need to get bicyclists to wear high-vis clothing, or we just need them to wear, to get lights, or we just need better street lights. There's, there's something else going on. So when you look at um, crashes and you know, why it matters, why traffic crashes in particular, when you have automobiles only involved in a crash, this is data from uh, Portland specifically, but it's, it's pretty typical. 60% of the time, there's only property damage. So, you know, fender benders or hitting a, you know, a light pole or whatever. But when an automobile is involved and a driver crashes into a bicycle or pedestrian, 93% of the time, it goes up, right? So this is why I became really interested in looking at drivers. Because, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're the ones to do, that can do harm to vulnerable road users. Now, someone corrected me, and, and he had a fair point that, um, while it is drivers and controlled cars, that doesn't mean that cars are completely exempt because when we have autonomous vehicles, we're going to have to worry about what their effect is on vulnerable road use. But, but I'm going to be when I talk today, I'll mostly be using the word drivers because that's who we have controlling cars for now. Um, so then the, looking at, you know, the, okay, we know the crashes are happening. We know they're serious. Uh, what causes them? Now, keeping in mind that a lot of the cross ca crash causation that you see in the records is um, what the driver said happened. And if the bicyclist doesn't survive, then they don't get to tell their side of the story. Um, this is data from the UK, but they have a lot of the similar issues we do in the US. So when they looked on the left side here, when you looked at what, like, why did you crash into that bicyclist? Um, you know, you have these inattention, the misjudgment of speed or path, and then this looked but failed to see crash, which I'm gonna talk a bit more, and then kind of all others, things like uh, drunk driving, uh, inebriation, things like that. But when you separate out just the daytime, like I talked about those daytime crashes, and you, there's no drunk driving, then you have these huge, you know, it's basically attributed to kind of inattention and distraction, which we know is a very hot and important issue right now, and then this looked but failed to see. So I wanted to look a little bit more into what exactly goes into, or what are the underlying mechanisms of attention. So I'm gonna test your attention. Um, and if you've seen this before, don't say anything. Don't shout out the answer. Uh, but you're going to focus on the team. So there's a team in black shirts and a team in white shirts, and they're each you know, passing the basketball just to their own teammates. So count the number of passes made by the players in white shirts. And it's just a minute long. So.
11? How many, anybody else? 15? Uh, anybody want to, let's see, hold on. All right, does, I'm trying to pause this here, but. No, no, it's, that's all right, I'll just let it finish. So uh, does anybody want to fess up that they did not see the gorilla while they were trying to count the passes? No, there's no shame in it. And if you guys, if the rest of you did, that's very impressive. Um, in multiple lab studies, about half of the people watching this video did not see the gorilla. And this is just an example, and it's, you know, it's kind of, obviously it's a contrived example, but it's an example of how we don't process everything in our visual environment. We just can't, right? It would be overwhelming. So our brains are making decisions all the time about what we attend to, what we pr mentally process, and how in particular, um, and it's not that you weren't looking, right? It's not, you're not distracted looking at your phone. It's a psychological lack of attention. And so you don't perceive um, an unexpected stimulus in plain sight, like a gorilla walking through a basketball game. And I added this emphasis, because I think this is really important when we talk about vulnerable road users, and bicyclists in particular, this idea of it's unexpected. So if you're not expecting to see a bicyclist coming from the right or whatever, you might be even less likely um, psychologically, not just visually, not to see them. So then that, you know, I talked about these looked but failed to see crashes, right? So then that kind of led me to question, like, well, okay, is that some of the mechanism, the psychological lack of attention rather than just visual um, about, oh, and, and you guys, you know, I should have said if you haven't heard this term looked but failed to see, but you may have heard it like, I just didn't see them. They came out of nowhere. Like, it wasn't, you know, so that's, that's something. And, and granted, sometimes people are just not being truthful. They weren't looking, but often they were. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how that plays into interactions in the roadway, right? This is just my, and how they are not always pleasant and they're not always safe. Um, and that's true for all different modes, potentially. This is just the clip art I had fun playing with. Um, and of course, like I said, we're gonna be focusing on uh, bicycles in particular. That's what this research or this study was on. But, you know, as I encourage you to think about how it might apply in other areas or, you know, kind of the areas that you're interested in or studying. So previous research um, shows that drivers, we don't respond to all pedestrians equally, right? And these are really fun headlines that people were really excited about when these studies, because everybody wanted to jump on to BMW drivers. This is out of the Bay Area, and it was a study of, they had their pedestrian was their participant, you know, he's part of the research team, and he just crossed the street over and over. And then they judged the status of the vehicles and whether they stopped or not. And the fancier the car, the less likely people were to stop. Right? And that fits with what we know about social psychology and kind of dominance and things like that, but nobody had looked at it before. Um, and it wasn't just BMWs, but you know, people, that was, it was fun to get, get down on the BMW drivers. Um, and then this last one is uh, a study that I led with some colleagues in Portland and now at and, um, University of Arizona, where you know, we were talking about how there's racial bias in a lot of different areas of you know, the our world, and then these issues of, okay, we know drivers don't necessarily respond the same to all pedestrians. What happens when those intersect? And so we paid a team of young white and young black men, and I um, bought them clothes so they were all dressed the same, um, taught them how to walk up to the crosswalk so their posture was the same. I told them when to cross based on an upstream traffic signal so there was enough time for the cars to see them. So I tried to control everything as best as I could, and field experiments are messy, but um, controlling everything I could, and we found that Indeed, drivers um, were, there was twice as many cars would pass our black men than white men without stopping. And if one car didn't, like the first car didn't stop, then like five more cars would, you know, five times more cars would pass, right? So again, more evidence that drivers aren't just operating, because it's humans, right? We're not just operating in this environment that's totally exempt from these social cognitions that we all have. Um, and then there's not as much research about drivers and bicyclists, but what research is, uh, there is says kind of the same thing. So you guys may have heard of this. Um, Ian Walker out of the UK did a study where he wore a wig some of the time and he wore a helmet or not. Um, and then he had an instrumented bicycle so he could tell like very precisely how closely the cars passed him. 
and he found that drivers gave more passing distance to women or people not wearing helmets. And he speculated that there was kind of a benevolent, benevolent sexism going on. So he thought, oh, a woman needs more care, I'll stay further away, or a, a person without a helmet you know, needs more care, um, or maybe it's less experienced. But he didn't stop the drivers, so that was, he just kind of had to speculate. Um, so those are just a couple headlines about that. So I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into this in too much detail, but this is a conceptual model I developed to guide my work during my dissertation, and I'll be using going forward. Where, and it's, it's related to other kind of um, social ecological models that you may have seen, and Van Acker, um, they did a travel behavior model, but it's nested, and this one's overlapping instead. But basically, you know, we have these socio-cultural environments, the individual, and then the physical environment, and when all those three intersect, that's where you have this roadway interaction, where say in this case drivers and bicyclists are interacting. But where those overlap, you also get things. Like here's one where public investment in facilities is not just a physical issue, it's like say cultural support for building bike things. So, um, and I use this just to show you what, these are the aspects of the model that I kind of focused on so I didn't get at some of these more physical issues. Um, but these are what I used to guide the study that I developed, which I will talk to you about next. Oh, and I wanna, you know, we talk about, we use the word attitude all the time. And I just wanna remind you, because it's important to understand what an attitude is, especially because it's relevant to what I did here. So um, social psychologists, psychologists talk about attitudes as having three components, the affective, the behavioral, and the cognitive. So your attitude is, we usually think about kind of the affective part, like how you feel about something, um, but also there's these intended or enacted behaviors, and then our thoughts or beliefs about it. So an important piece of that is attitudes can have both explicit and implicit components. So the explicit would be they're conscious, you know, I can ask you your attitude, how you feel about something, you can say, yes, I love pizza, or no, I don't like beer. Um, but your implicit attitudes are below your conscious awareness. By definition, um, you know, you can't, you don't know that you have them, but there's lots of evidence that we have them, and they can be involuntarily activated. So this is really important, I think, to travel behavior and interactions in the environment, uh, because the attitudes are distinct. Um, they're related, so they're picking up some of the same thing, but they are, they are picking up different constructs, and that very importantly, the implicit attitudes can be a better predictor of behavior in certain contexts, um, especially where there's a high cognitive load, which when you think about it, the driving task is one of the most cognitively difficult things that most of us engage in at some point. When, you know, most of us aren't airline pilots, um, but driving is an incredibly complex task, all the things you have to do both inside the car and things you're watching for outside the vehicle. Um, and then it's also implicit, also comes into things like prejudice or nonverbal behaviors which again, much of our communication on the roadway is nonverbal, right? We rely on each other's signals and what we think are their intentions. So the kind of the overarching questions that I used um, when I, in guiding this work was this question, okay, what are drivers' attitudes about bicyclists, right? And this, this seems really basic, but it's, there's not been a lot of research in this area. We have plenty of anecdotal data. Um, most people, when they find out, like if we're talking at a party and they find out what I do, they have plenty of stories. So we have lots of anecdotal data, right? You guys may have opinions yourself, uh, but hasn't been studied that much. Um, and then what predicts those behaviors? Is it just, is it just our demographics? Is it just a, an age thing or a gender thing? Or are there other things going on? Um, and then what does that say about how they actually behave around bicyclists? So I developed this, uh, how many people in here have taken implicit association test, IAT, anybody? Few people, not that many. So the IAT is one of the most, or it's the most commonly used implicit method, um, which again, thinking of these implicit, these subconscious attitudes that we have, an implicit method tests them. So you're being tested on that attitude without knowing it. Um, and the IAT is uh, useful for a couple reasons, not the least because it's hard to game. So, um, and I'll explain in a sec what I mean by that. But what it is, is your, it's your basic, it's a sorting task. So you're linking concepts, and in this case, Whoops, the concepts were driver and bicyclist. So people either saw a word or uh, driver, bicyclist, or these images. Um, and then you have to link those with an attribute. And the simplest version, which I use, is these just positive and negative evaluations. So you either have good feelings towards something or bad feelings, or you associate good things with the concept or bad things. Um, and before anybody asks, because people always ask, uh, these are definitely look like men. Um, I tried to use gender neutral images. And it turns out that's really hard. I did pre-testing and humans were like 
you know, wired to want to assign gender, culturally I should say, wired to assign gender. And so I just went with men because men are kind of the dominant bicyclist in the US and future research will do look at other um, social identities. So to just really quickly run through this to give you an idea of what it kind of, I mean, this isn't exactly what it looks like, but this is how it functions. So on this side of the screen, you see the concept and the attribute, concept attribute, and then you have to use your right hand or your left hand to link. You say, okay, a word happy, that's a positive word, so I need to link that over here. So I use my left hand, I click the E key or whatever, um, and so on. Negative word, that's negative. Oh, that's a bicyclist, that goes over there, right? And then they're switched, so these things are randomly switched so that you know, I'm not leading people in a certain way. Now bicyclist is linked with negative. Same idea, right? So the idea, the whole test is based on the idea that the more closely linked things are in our mind, the quicker we're, we'll respond to them. Like the, the, the quicker we can sort them together. So here's just a screenshot of what you kind of see when you're about to start. So again, those images explains what you do. Um, here's an actual screenshot for what it looks like. So the images, you know, are randomly flipped and they're sized, so about the same. So then you do all that and you get, and it's, you know, just lasts a couple minutes and you get this difference score essentially, which says, you know, how quickly you can sort driver good and bicyclist good subtracted means your preference or your bias towards one or the other. Um, and I just, I, I go into that in more depth because I just want you to kind of understand what's underlying. It's a little bit hard to convey um, in a talk. Uh, but I certainly encourage you to go to, and I'll talk about the public site, where you can go and take, there's, I mean, mostly this is used in domain, the domains of like race and gender. So the very, you know, kind of most popular, most widely ones are on racism. But you can take IITs having to do with race, gender, women in STEM, politics. Um, and then at the end it spits out like, oh, you have moderate, you know, preference for, uh, or you have moderate bias towards thinking women don't belong in STEM. And then you know you can think about like is that is that because I feel that way or that's just like the cultural messages we get, et cetera. So then the rest of the survey included um, attitude questions, uh, and I'll explain which ones I used in a little bit. So these attitudes about being a driver, um, attitudes towards other drivers, and then attitudes towards bicyclists. And those kind of these were developed based on some studies of drivers toward attitudes towards motorcyclists and towards equestrians, which sounds funny. Um, but actually there's a lot of similarities with kind of this vulnerable road user and drivers having to negotiate around people riding horses, which apparently happens in the UK more than it happens here. Um, and then the rights, rules, and responsibilities, which is probably something if you're a bicyclist you hear a lot about. Bicyclists should, you know, ride on the sidewalk, don't ride on the sidewalk, take the lane, don't take the lane, et cetera. Um, and then representativeness is like, how much do you think bicyclists out there represent you? Um, and then the behaviors question, so, understanding like, okay, how close or how fast should I pass a bicyclist when I have to pass them when I'm driving? Um, how much do I feel like if I, I need to pass a bicyclist? Or are people getting behind, behind me getting mad? Um, do I, you know, exact, so those kind of examples of perceptual performance and skills is what I call them. And then have you ever honked, shouted, or gestured at a bicyclist who made you angry? I won't ask you too fast up about that. Um, and then how nervous does it make you? So these are the kind of the, the behaviors. And then the survey asks, you know, the normal kind of demographics individual travel behavior, which because as I'll talk about, I was interested in, um, you know, okay, drivers, have they bicycled? Why did they bicycle? Does that affect any of these attitudes and behaviors? And then I wanted to use the built environment, right? Because many of you are interested in planning and understanding the role of the built environment. Unfortunately, I only had zip code data. Um, and so I won't go into the weeds on this unless you guys want to hear about it. But uh, the EPA smart location database, because I was trying to look at like street density as a proxy for potential bikeability. Um, and then also, I ended up using the American Community Survey just commute share information, which I can go into why that's not ideal, but at least it gives me a very rough measure of how many people are bicycling around where this person was likely to be driving. So um, I partnered with this group, Project Implicit, which is, uh, they were out of Harvard, and they're kind of the originators of this implicit association test. So you can go to projectimplicit.net or to that site there. Um, and then you can either register or just as a guest, you can take any number of these tests. And it's really interesting, so I encourage you to do it. Uh, and I ended up getting 676 people. This is at least a county with at least one response. So it's pretty spread out around the country, which has its benefits <coughs> and its um, detriments. As someone, I forgot who I was talking with before, there's, you know, as you 
can probably relate depending on where you came from. There's very different driving cultures, right? I mean, even within, probably within Southern California, within California, within the US. Um, so while it's really nice to have this sample from all around, it also means I can't say a lot about any one location. So like I said, 676 people took the test, uh, about two thirds women, which is pretty common for survey research. Um, mean age was 41, which is good because I didn't know if I was gonna just have you know, a lot of people who heard about this from a class, not my, not my study, but an implicit association um, test, which is how people got linked up. Um, and then it was wider and fewer people of color that took the test. Um, a slightly older sample, uh, much higher education levels. And I, you know, that may play into, we have to think about what the implications of that are um, about, you know, the results. But that's the survey. And then I was really wanted to get people who drive a lot, right? That's who I'm trying to talk to. And I indeed was able to get, you know, 75% of them had driving more than 10 years. Um, anybody who'd been driving fewer tended to just be younger and hadn't been old enough to be licensed that long. And then people drive a lot. Right, so 87% drive at least four days a week, uh, 57 drive seven days a week, so, which is again what I wanted. This surprised me, over half of them had bicycled in the last year, um, but almost half of those had ridden only for fun or exercise. And of course, there's a lot of benefits for riding for fun or exercise, as you know, you know with health, um, but you know, I hypothesized that that might not have the same beneficial effects for how they are as drivers. Um, and then, even of the people who'd ridden in the last year, almost half don't ride in a typical week, right? And another quarter. So I had very few people who actually ride at all frequently, which was fine. I just wanted to get people who had some experience. So this is the distribution overall, that implicit association test. And I should say that no one had done an implicit association test, even though they're very widely used for decades, but uh, in this area. So I didn't even know if I could measure this. Is it, was I gonna get a result that even made sense? Um, so you first see this is a pretty normal distribution. Um, so it's like, well, that's great statistically, but maybe that could just be, you know, what you'd expect if it was just kind of randomly or didn't really measure anything. So then I needed to look at, okay, well, how does this relate to the, my other attitudes? So, and this is, I'm still playing with the best way to um, try and display kind of these associations or these relationships. But this is, this slide is just the demographic in the built environment and then the driver implicit bias. So the older, the, the older or the higher or greater any of these, the lower the implicit bias for these. So the older people got, they actually held less pro-driver implicit bias. Um, higher education did. Uh, the higher the street intersection density, which I said like is a proxy potentially for more bicycle, bikeability, um, and then the bike commute, uh, commute mode share. So actually the higher the commute, share, commute mode share, the lower the implicit bias. Now, these ones are positively correlated. And so being a driver is an important part of who I am. So that's that kind of driver identity was associated with more pro-driver implicit bias. And this is like kind of, this is an intuitive result, right? But this is what makes me feel like, oh, my implicit measure actually captured something, you know, measuring what I think I'm trying to measure. Um, and these kind of more, what I would call negative towards bicyclists, anti-bicyclist attitudes, like, oh, you should have to pass a license test. You shouldn't have hold up traffic. Um, those also were, again, kind of, it's an intuitive, intuitive result, but good to see in the data. Um, and then, conversely, people who had kind of more what I would call more pro-bicyclist attitudes had lower driver implicit bias or more positive bicyclist implicit bias. So again, it says, yeah, this measure is actually picking something up. Um, and then some of these are, you know, these other things were just not correlated and seem to be independent. Oh, and then, again, with kind of the, the travel behavior, what do you know? The more days a week a respondent drives, the higher their pro-driver implicit bias. Um, and then the more they bicycle, the less pro-driver implicit bias. And keeping in mind all the time that I'm hypothesizing that this matters because this implicit bias can play a role in decisions we make in high speed or you know, high stress environments like the road. So then I just wanted to look, and this is my heaviest kind of statistical slide, I promise. Um, I just wanted to see if these attitudes grouped. It's a little bit <laughs> unwieldy to look at all these attitudes independently. So I want to say, okay, do these kind of show that they might be grouping on some kind of underlying construct? So I did a factor analysis. You can see the loadings if that's what you're into. The closer this number is to one, the more closely they are associated with that factor. So these are, this is how, these are the individual questions that people answered. Um, oh, I guess 
I dropped the thing, but they answered it from one to six Likert style. So one being strongly disagree, six being strongly agree. So as I might have expected, and I'm just gonna show you here, I then took those same groupings and I gave them kind of names. Um, so as you might expect, all these questions about driver identity grouped together, that's good. Um, and then these questions all to me reflected kind of support for the automobile system. So building infrastructure is a good investment of public funds, should bikes be able to filter, and then whose fault is it when people collide? And this is more about social norms to me. So this is n negative loading. Basically it means people, if they're angry about bicyclists but willing to excuse drivers breaking the rules, then that shows kind of a more pro-driver, anti-bicyclist social norm. And then this idea of not holding up car traffic. And then these I expected to group in there, but they were just like really stuck together. Um, this licensing and registering and paying road taxes, which I kind of think of as an authorita like, like authoritative bent, but I just called it legitimacy to make it simple. So again, this idea of driver identity, kind of this how important is it to you to be a driver and a skilled one? Um, do you support the system? Do you think drivers are kind of the dominant roadway group and are you willing to enforce that? And then this belief that you know, bicyclists need to do more to be legitimate roadway users. So again, looking to see, and this is how, what you would expect based on the earlier associations, that the implicit attitude was indeed correlated with all these explicit attitudes, but they're pretty, they're very small, um, which you know, again speaks to this possibility that they're related but distinct, so it's measuring something a little bit different. Um, and these, I'm sorry for the ugly graphs, I did not have time to make these pretty. Um, but these just show you those same, you know, so we have these associations, this shows you the relationship again, where, you know, this is on the x-axis here, this bias, so bicyclist or driver, and then how much you are pro-driver, or you identify as a driver, that's the relationship intuitively we'd expect. Same thing with this support for the autocentric system. Same, I mean, there's obviously differences in kind of where the thresholds are, but same general relationship with um, this pro-driver, anti-bicyclist, and then this, whether you think, you know, bicyclists should do more to be legitimate road users. So, so as a researcher, you're like, okay, cool, this is, you know, this is showing, it's not necessarily good for bicyclists or driver relations, but it's really good to say like, okay, my measure is picking something up. So then, another thing I did is I wanted to see, okay, what happens when bicyclists intersect with other kind of thing? And, and in the future, I'd like to look more at you know, like I said, race and gender, but at this, it was a more simple version. Um, but I kind of hypothesized, especially based on Ian Walker's work with the, you know, the helmet and not, that drivers don't just see all bicyclists as the exact same thing, right? So I, I first I asked people just an open-ended question, uh, you know, what, what are the five words or phrases you think of when you think of bicyclists? And these all, this is just a word cloud, right? So the bigger the word, the more often people use the word. And I think this is really important, especially as public health um, interested folks. Uh, so you see athletic, healthy, health conscious. This friendly is actually tied to the eco and environmentally friendly. And so, you know, one thing this says to me is that people get it that bicycling's healthy. Like we can stop beating that drum, right? We, people, people know, but that could be also othering, right? If you think, oh, I'm not that fit, or oh, I'm not putting on spandex or whatever, and that's your image of a bicyclist, then that can actually keep you potentially from taking it up. But, um, but you'll also notice some socially loaded words here, like hipster, <laughs> right? Poor, um, brave, that's kind of an interesting one. Uh, cheap, crazy, peaceful. I mean, it's kind of all over the place, right? Yeah, oh yeah, rude, that's it. Where's it? somewhere in here, rude somewhere in there. Oh yeah, here we go, rude, um, thin, yeah, so, some of these, uh, oh, tight clothes. I think that's what tight was. Uh, but anyway, so I think there's a lot more here. I haven't had much chance to, to do this, but again, this is kind of what people's first gut thing was. So people do have idea of bicyclists. Um, and then I showed them these three subtypes. Again, I was kind of, I decided to go with men because that's, it was just easiest. Otherwise I'd have to, you know, kind of double or triple my study size. So I picked what I felt were three and I did some pre-testing and these were, you know, people were seeing these as three distinct uh, bicyclist. Anybody want to like offer a word or phrase when they see this bicyclist? Fast? Athlete? Come on, audience participation. How about this one? There's no wrong answers, by the way. Old, okay. That, that was one of the first things that everyone said. Which is weird, because if you're like, if you really look at this, you're like, well, nothing about that person really 
says that they're older, but that's a really common thing. Anybody else? Why might that person be bicycling? Anybody have a motivation? What's that? Cruising, yeah, cruising. Okay, and how about this person? Student. Student. I mean, the backpack I know is kind of a, um, I, I tried to like carve off the backpack but then in like Photoshop, but I'm not very good at it, so. Um, but the idea is you look at these and you say, okay, there's three different bicycles. So then I ask them, and this is a really crowded slide, but then I ask people to, you know, to, to select from a list of attributes, what do you think each bicycle, and I did it separately, uh, what attributes fit them. And the point that you don't have to parse this whole slide, but the idea is that there's variation, right? So there's different things that people assign to these different bicycles. So over 90% of the people, this is the percent of respondents, said that this bicyclist was fit, right? An athlete. Um, whereas, let's see, like the second bicyclist, almost nobody thought they were aggressive, but almost 30% or you know, 25 to 30 thought these guys were aggressive. Smug, fewer people than I thought said smug. Um, you know, viewing about how people take risks, whether they're skilled, so that gets back to the Ian Walker thing of like, oh, do I need to take more care potentially? Like, how skilled are they? Um, et cetera, and this is not a, co you know, a comprehensive list. Of course, I had to keep my survey somewhat short. But again, I think I just wanted to start to tease out, do drivers make decisions consciously and subconsciously about you know, different bicyclists on the road? So then I just wanna wrap up with you know, talking about this overtaking, you know, which, um, cra so overtaking, like passing, um, those are tend to like rear end crash, so if a, a bicyclist gets hit by a car, it tends to be the most fatal, usually because happen, they happen at higher speeds. Um, and then right hooks, which also happen after a car passes a bicyclist and then, you know, turns in front of them or turns into them. So this is why it's a really important behavior. So, in what I call the most obvious finding ever in research, I asked people, are you a skilled driver? And 93% said yes. <laughs> um, and it's not that that's wrong. Like, it could, maybe it's just the 7% who are causing all the crashes, right? Or also maybe we are a little bit, you know, think we're better than we are. Right, yeah, we're definitely biased. Um, but then one thing I was, you know, as a researcher, I was heartened that when I then asked people you know, even though they said, yes, I'm skilled, they were willing to admit, like, oh, well, I'm not actually comfortable deciding how to pass a bicyclist. Um, or when my car's moving, it's hard, like, to s tell how far they are on the other side, right? So this is something that I think needs um, more. So it's, it's good that people are willing to admit this, but now we need to figure out, okay, what do we do about that? Um, and it, the numbers were even more stark when, again, this is the skilled driver. This question of nerves or being startled by a bicyclist, right? I'm nervous when I have to drive close to someone. And that may very well be like, I, I'm cognizant of my ability to cause this person harm, right? Whether it's because I don't want to get sued or be liable or because you know, I'm a decent human being and I don't want to hurt someone and probably both of those things. Um, this is a big deal. And, and part of the big deal is that when we're nervous or anxious, we can make, we're more likely to make errors, right? So you're more likely to overcorrect with your car or things like that. Um, and then, but, in, you know, hearteningly, this bicycling frequency had a positive effect. So people who did, you know, if they didn't bicycle, you know, they're still, you know, people are, you know, comfortable, but a third of the people said I'm not comfortable. But if they biked in the last year, that improved whether they were comfortable. And then if they bike at least once, so they're a frequent bicyclist, it went way up, right? So that's something about, you know, as we say, getting butts on bikes and also doing it frequently. Um, this is, you know, a, something that needs more of a look. So this question of implicit bias, when I did, and I have like full regression modeling, which I'm not sharing today, but I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, I look, you know, when you control for the demographics and the built environment and, and things like that, implicit bias, um, people were less likely, you know, when other things didn't predict it, implicit bias did predict whether people were less likely to check for bicyclists again um, before they turn, so that right hook concern or left hook. Um, and then they're also less likely to believe that uh, you know, a driver is at fault. And that can kind of be this thing of like the crash, not accident. I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of, I think that came up in the, one of the seminars, this idea of um, you know, crashes, all crashes are preventable. But if you think, oh, well we crashed, but it's not really my fault, you know, then does that affect how you interact with people? So these are the things I'd just like you to take away. Um, so it is, it is possible to measure implicit bias, which is really you know, exciting. 
Um, and I think it, it's worthy of further, stu further study. I'm not saying that we have to be measuring implicit bias in every travel survey, and I'm not saying it is the key to understanding all interactions, but I think it is important uh, to understand and how it may play into certain contexts. Um, and then these implicit attitudes are related. They're, they're associated in the ways I would expect, but they are distinct. So I'm picking up something different. Um, and then this, these social psychological theories, these intergroup relations having to do with um, social dominance and system justification, um, they can help us you know, as a framework for understanding some of this road safety stuff instead of just thinking about like, oh, travel speed or oh, lane width, right? We have to understand that we are interacting on the road as social groups. Um, and then you know, this implicit bias helped, it added explanatory power even once you controlled for these other, um, other variables I had. And then, you know, these, it's particularly important, like I said, for these safety relevant behaviors like overtaking and passing. Um, and then, <laughs> I love this bumper sticker, um, the personal experience as a bicyclist. And, and I think this is worth highlighting because some of these, you know, underlying biases, if you're a planner or an engineer, you're not working on that stuff directly. But we can work on getting people on, on bicycles. Um, but like I said, it may take more frequent bicycling. Like it can't, it's not enough to just do like a fun open streets event once a year. It may, it may be, you know, take more bicycling. Say, I can't remember if you guys have bike share here yet, but that's one where, you know, maybe we don't need to convert people into full-time commuters, but if you hop on a, on a bike for a short, you know, lunchtime ride once a week, maybe that's enough to make you a better driver. Um, and then in the models, again, one of the things that came up, because I asked people not only, you know, have they ridden, but for what purpose, and it mattered, right? So um, depending on what attitude to behavior, it really mattered where, you know, it wasn't just commuting for fun or exercise, like I said, right? So we have to think about not just getting people on for any one purpose, but thinking about increasing some of this, particularly what we call utilitarian riding, so for commuting or running errands, um, and then also this issue of, uh, accompanying children, which can affect this. Um, and then, you know, I didn't get to go into this too much, but 83% of my respondents said that they feel like if they don't pass a bicyclist, other drivers get annoyed with them. So again, this pressure is, and it, and it a lot of the things I looked at didn't um, predict that. It's just like universally felt. And so we need to better understand that and how do we shift that. Um, again, because it can result in you know, some of our most unsafe behaviors. And then um, this implicit bias question I said, like again, it, you know, this not checking for bicyclists. Um, and then this higher bike commute share had a positive effect, or a, I should say a positive association. And you know, for people who are less likely to have these negative social norms or feelings towards bicyclists, um, and then their likelihood of uh, checking for bicyclists, and you guys may have heard of the safety in numbers effect. So one, one person or multiple people have posited that it's actually an expectation um, issue, so safety and expectation. So it's like if there are a lot of bicyclists, then you expect to see bicyclists and you're looking for them. Um, just you know, limits, of course. There's a bit of a self-selection bias on this. Uh, people opted into taking some kind of IAT, but then they were randomly assigned to my test. It was a very simple IAT, so you know, I wasn't testing any particular driver or bicyclist related you know, kind of concept. It was just positive, negative. Do you feel positive towards this, negative towards this? Um, the survey, you know, health in particular, you guys in psychology use a lot of scales, but they tend to have, you know, a good battery of questions that you can do. I just didn't have that many items, so I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't put these forward as scales, but I just kind of grouped the measures where they made sense. Uh, the behavior, of course, is self-report. I'm just, you know, having to go off people, what people tell me they do. Um, the built environment, I didn't have, because I didn't have enough data to say like, oh, I know what the infrastructure is. I know how many miles of bike lanes there are in this city um, because it was so spread out. You know, I just had to use kind of a very rough proxy, like I said. Um, and then I didn't get to use any structural equation modeling in this yet, I'd like to, um, which the reason that'll be useful is it can help me tease out whether some of these things like your bicycling experience kind of moderate or mediate um, some of the attitudes and behaviors. Uh, and then finally, uh, from a research perspective, you know, again, tying it more to behavior, because this is just self-report behavior, um, how does road design, because that's something, you know, that's kind of the area I work in or one of the areas, um, how does it shift those attitudes if that's what we want? Can the design overrule these implicit biases that I'm not able to work directly on? 
And then can you know our, our other areas that we're working on, like education enforcement, be better informed by viewing it through these kind of inner group, understanding us as social users. So for instance, we can make that the behavior tie a little bit better with a driving simulator, which is uh, a study I hope to do in the very near future. Although that's, of course, not still the roadway environment. As you probably deal with as health researchers, there's ethical issues for testing behavior in the environment. Um, and this question of shifting design, right? So looking at things like I've talked with Dr. Sammy about you know, pre and post studies, where you can look at before, you can look at after, and you say, OK, I'm controlling for everything else. Is this helping shift? Um, and then for how long, how long does it take for people to learn um, in the new environment? And then how lasting is, um, you know, are positive benefits? And then when it comes to like healthy um, design and active living, how much do some of these social issues that I've talked about play into people's decisions about you know, making, they're doing, engaging in these healthy transportation behaviors? And then, you know, I, like I said, I encourage you to think about you know, these methods and some of the theories behind it, how that might work in other domains. This is um, supposed to be like responding to hazard like a disaster. It's actually a playground or something, but that's why that person's so smiley. Um, but like disaster response or community building. Um, and then for pra practitioners, because I know there's practitioners or soon to be practitioners on the audience, uh, it's heartening when demographics aren't destiny, right? We can't change demographics, but you know that they weren't, sometimes they matter, but a lot of times they didn't. Um, like I said, the bicyclist is a really important predictor of being better drivers. Um, but again, you know, kind of focusing on what the type is um, and the frequency. And then understanding, you know, again, as a practitioner, you're gonna, not going to be getting way into it, you know, testing or working on implicit bias, but just understanding that that might help explain why you know, some interactions are more negative than we'd expect or don't go the way we'd expect. We're not getting the results from the infrastructure that we expect. Um, you know, needing to understand fear and nerves better that I've talked about. Um, you know, so, okay, so we have this implicit biases. We have these explicit, you know, social cognitions about what each other should do on the road and whether we belong to be there. What do you do about that? Um, you know, really designing facilities that support, for one, us to, I call it, appeal to our better angels, right? So if we can, um, you know, not rely on these implicit biases and some of these more snap judgments. Um, and then what that really means, uh, largely, is that we need to slow or separate things. So we either need to slow how people and when people are interacting, or when we can't do that, separating the modes to make it safer. Which, these are not new, right? These are things that we've known for a while in the profession, um, but it's nice to have more empirical evidence to back that up. And with that, I will wrap up and take questions. Thank you. We might have time for a couple questions before you all join us for lunch, right? Do you guys have questions? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be back to ask some Did you ever consider um, switching the questions so doing contrapositive? Because sometimes when a question is asked, it sort of biases the person. Like if it says, am I a good driver? And then other times you, am I a bad driver? Sure. Or I'm afraid to pass, or I'm nervous, or I'm not nervous, I'm not afraid. Yeah, and so. to see if the, if it gets the same results. That's a great question. So I didn't, I don't think I said very well that overall my questions were split about half and half. So that I wasn't like leading them to being all anti-bicyclists or pro-bicyclists. So those, so you know, they're reverse worded and then I reverse coded so they were all on the same kind of pro-driver scale. I wasn't able to do more what you were saying just because of how short it was. But in the future with replication also when I'm able to do a little bit longer survey, I was very limited on the length for this particular project um, because of the contract and the group I went with. Um, I wasn't able to do that because you're absolutely right. Um, and I think I'll just be looking at that, yeah, moving forward. But at least the questions I do have there, they're swapped so that they're not all one direction or the other pro or driver or pro bicyclist. Another question for Dr. Goddard. 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 I can't say that. I don't know why. It's my implicit bias. You, have a, you just have a nicer lilt than it comes with. Any other questions? Otherwise, you are welcome to join us for lunch in the second floor of Public Health AIRB. See you there. One more round of applause.